All right, we have hit the time to start our keynote here. So with that being said, our first talk is going to be from two of my favorite individuals within the Sands Blue Team ecosystem here. We've got Justin Henderson and Ismail Valenzuela. They are going to be talking about one topic that I know everyone is going to be interested in, right? And there's a lot of interesting debate about this going back and forth. Zero trust, you've heard about it for years. Is it real? Is it something we can do? Is it an acad academic pipe dream and all that sort of stuff? Um, real interested to watch this talk myself. Uh, this is something that I think has become much more realistic over the past few years. And it's starting to creep in in a very real way in a lot of, in a lot of ways. So um, with that being said, I will hand the mic over to Justin and Ismail for our first talk of the Blue Team Summit. Enjoy, everyone. Awesome. I, I feel like I have to like slide out. Boop, 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 and come back in. Okay, all right. Glad to be here, everybody. <laughs> now, John says he we're his favorite people, but he says that to everybody. He, he He's just like that. So uh, on the concept of zero trust, you, you got to be a little careful of folks like that, right? They, they kind of talk you up and, oh, okay. A little off topic, but... <laughs> You I was just going zero. to say that. I was yeah, just go. going to say that about about John as well. It's like, but thank you, thank you. We love you too, and we love to be here with so many blue teamers. Have you realized how many new people is coming into the summit into into the field of blue teaming? That's amazing. Yeah. So in the, the the new to blue team Slack channel, I've already been monitoring this, and it's it's great to see. Like we've got folks from healthcare, we've got folks from retail distribution, management, telecom, like. There's a lot of folks entering the field. Some of you have 30 years experience that I'm saying, and some of you are like, I'm not even in the field yet. So this is fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for coming. So well, let's get into the topic, right? Do we have to introduce ourselves? I don't think so, right? I can summarize Justin's uh, bio in like, you have too many certificates, too many certifications, right? That's <laughs> it's like, it's like Pokemon. You can't have enough, right? You got to catch them all. <laughs> Yeah, the, this slide's boring. I, this is Ismail. Ismail is fantastically awesome. Cares about the industry. We're both involved with Sands in some fashion. Let's let's just dive in because I know we we have let's talk about blue teaming and, and zero trust. And I wanted to recognize and you know pause here for a second, especially since we have so many uh, new people coming into the field to celebrate the 35 years of blue teaming. All right, so you know, give it a hand to blue teaming. <laughs> 35 years. Uh, this, yeah, this is an awesome book, and it was written in 1986 by Clifford Stoll. Uh, if you haven't read this book, highly recommend it, because to me, the best thing about this book is the mindset, right? And we're going to talk about mindset today, and we're going to talk about pseudo trust and how that represents a change, right, in, in the mindset. Interestingly, many of the technologies that we have used over the past 30, 30, uh, 30 years, right, have been, uh, uh, were born in 1987, like the first uh, intrusion detection model. Right. The first paper was written back then. The first uh, firewall came up in 87. The first AV company was founded back then too. And I think something else happened in 87, right? Just yeah, so, so I was born in 86. So, you know, the ultimate okay. blue team entered the world. There you home. go. <laughs> <laughs> so the question is, how are we doing? Because we must be doing good, right? We've been doing this for 35 years, doing threat detection and, and all of that. So what does our threat detection or blue teaming looks like for... Yeah. That's about right. Yeah. It's, you know, you're, you're out on the picnic with the family, you're sitting at the table and a bird, a monkey, a squirrel eats your food. Now it's different if you're the one giving them the food, although you can get in trouble for that because it's not natural for them. They can get sick, they can get fat and you know, it's a different thing, but yeah, I feel like we constantly get our lunch stolen and we're surprised because I don't know about you, but the companies I'm dealing with, they've got EDR, they've got next gen firewall, they have cloud security, cloud this, cloud that. They're using Terraform, they're... but it still happens a lot. Yep. <laughs> we, we still get uh, taken by surprise every single time, right? I, I like to ask uh, my students uh, come to five thirty, uh, which, by the way, you know, we co-authored. And uh, we, we, we like to ask them, is like, how many times do you get to surprise the adversary? And that's a concept that it is also part of zero trust. We're going to talk about, about that. So in summary, I think that we're failing because of a failed mindset, right? That's what you're saying, Justin. Too much emphasis on the perimeter. Uh, the obsession with addressing a problem that is a, it's a business problem, it's a people's problem with just technology, right? Technology is obviously part of it, but it's not the only thing. Trust but verify. What do we say now, right? We say something like, 
trust nothing, verify everything. Because you can totally trust nothing. Zero right. trust is totally 100% achievable everywhere, all the time. We're going to get back to that. Wait, uh, sar that's sarcasm, by the way, for those of you who don't know me. Prevention <laughs> and, and, and compliance focus, right? Which is something that if we're not careful, we can bring back with zero trust. We're going to talk about that too. And, and something that I like to say a lot, which is security is not digital, right? Security is analog, just like time. So answering your, your challenge there, Justin, I don't think we can achieve 100% you know, zero trust, but we'll, we'll get there. Now, have you, have you had the chance to read some of these uh, documents coming out of the, the US government? Because there are I have. You know, it's getting a little hard because there's like a new document every day. Like, what was it, Tuesday this week? There was the, the new Office yep. of Budget uh, document, the mandate. And so we've been hearing about zero trust for a while. Like, years on like 2010 i think is when john kinderweg came out with the concept and the concepts are really not new what it to me this is this is me totally speaking off the cusp personally it's the term zero trust is so catchy and so now there's this marketing flurry and there's these documents and to be honest a lot of the stuff in this these documents is actually really good but there's also stuff that I think is taken out of context, like any good writing. Vendors get a hold of it. They put their spin on it. There's compliance frameworks that are guaranteed coming out right now as of the writing of Tuesday. And um, it's interesting to see how this is presented for adoption. So I think what we're trying to do here is we're going to try to talk through what looks to be the path that is being pushed for zero trust, kind of what is it? And then how do you practically implement it? Because even like this, this document just came out, right? September 7th, 2021, like it just came out. And what, all of this has to be implemented by 2024, if I remember correctly? Is that right, Ismail? Yep. Yeah, the document, we were just talking about this a uh, couple of days ago because we had this presentation ready, right? <laughs> and then, you know, all these documents came up. It's like, Justin, we need to, we need to talk about this. Because there are several statements in this document that are very interesting. First of all, uh, the OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, uh, they produced this document, this draft for public comments. And they're saying within 60 days, these agencies, they have to uh, come up with a, with a strategy, with a plan, right? Until, as you said, 2024, uh, 2024. And they have to nominate somebody to lead these efforts within 30 days. So it sounds like a bit overwhelming, right? So we wanted to clarify a little bit what you can do what are the things that maybe you need to, you know, dig a bit further uh, that may or may not make sense uh, and, and what you can practically do with, with all of these? Because some of these statements are very, very interesting. Some of them are specific and some of them very broad. Some of them, I think, I wonder how much expertise was behind the decision making. Because some of them, I actually think I contradict personally. Uh, and, and for those of you in private sector who feel like this type of document doesn't affect you, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, but it's going to trickle down to private sector. It's not even going to trickle. This is going to be a flood. This okay. is going to be pushed hardcore across the industry. It, it already has been. Um, but because of this, it's going to just, it's going to be even faster. So let's keep so, going so, with this. So let's talk a little bit about the, uh, where this comes from. You mentioned John Kindervac, right? He uh, worked for, for, uh, for Forrester back in the day. 2010, and he replied to this uh, request for comments from NIST on how to develop a security framework for uh, critical infrastructure. And he essentially like laid out the basic principles of uh, zero trust. And essentially that everything is hostile, right? You can't trust anything. Internal, external threats are always there. Um, the internal network doesn't mean that it's secure. So you should treat, that's actually something that we can find in the latest draft from the government. Uh, you have to treat every single application as if it is public facing. That's an interesting statement, right? And I, I think it's helpful to, to think along those lines. It's a change of mindset. Oh no, my application is behind the firewall. Therefore, it is protected. How many times have you heard that? Yep. And right? in that document, I think it's worth calling out. Didn't they say that they can basically randomly select something that's supposed to be internal access only? and then force you to make it internet facing just to test your security? Yeah, not randomly, but yeah, kind of like <laughs> choose one of the FISMA medium applications and put it on the 
uh, uh, on the cloud, right, or somewhere public facing, just as a test of the policies and the controls that you need to apply. So that's that's going to be interesting. But notice that the last two bullets, right? Everything must be proven or authenticated devices, users, network flows, encrypt all the things. Wow, that's that's a big statement. Log and inspect all traffic. But one of the things I like the most about, about this model is the variable trust concept, right? And I think this is actually the key of everything to understand why this is not just a prevention-oriented framework, but a detection-oriented framework. So many of these documents, they miss that, that point. We'll talk more about that, or they just talk briefly about it. But the key thing about implementing variable trust is that you need to keep track of the behavior, right? So this is just like a credit score system in the, in the US. Um, when I came into the US in 2014, coming from Europe, I was new to all of this and I, I quickly learned this is important, right? You made good use of your credit, yeah, goes up. <laughs> you don't make good use of your credit card, goes, goes down. Um, so, or, or you go cash is king, but that's a different, different concept. <laughs> oh, you gotta tell me more about that, Justin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but that's so the idea, right? Yeah, so it, it, in, the, in this concept, by the way, is an extension to zero trust. It's an application of zero trust that I think Ismail and I both truly believe in because it's where you take technologies that are under your control and you adjust them in an automated logical flow by putting in you know, questions and barriers. So in here, just this is a completely theoretical example but you would program this in say like a next gen firewall, identity management, a proxy. So this is stuff you can actually apply, but it's important you understand what we're doing. So if you think about this, it's like, let's say you're trying to access credit card data for your job. What we're saying is rather than just, are you in the PCI users group? Let's actually make this more of a verified authentication flow. You are authenticated, 10 points, yay, right? The device, the computer you're on also authenticates things like Kerberos, et cetera, 10 points. It's from a known IP space or geolocation, 10 points. You have 30 points. But what we're saying is arbitrarily, you need 40 points to access credit card information. You don't have 40 points. Conceptually, I think most of us are just like access denied. But notice you can go both ways with this system. You have 30 points, Ismail. I'm sorry, you, you don't have access, but if you can do some form of multi-factor, I'll give you 20 points. Mm -hmm. He does it, smart token, a client certificate, you know, a SMS, I know there's issues with that, but you're controlling the logic. He passes that, he now gains access because he has 50 points. He starts accessing sketchy sites and he starts losing points. It goes both ways here. This right. is not how you can verify things continuously in an automated fashion from a concept, and then we'll apply these to actual technologies. So it sounds like a great concept, right? Let's, let's have a look at, at a use case or a scenario where we can see how this could be used in, in real world. And again, this is taken out of a, uh, one of the government documents. Uh, uh, this is from uh, DSAS. And it talks about two different scenarios. One where the malicious actor uh, is using stolen credentials, right? and it's using its own device. So we can see this one at the bottom right here. And since the device is not authenticated, one of the key points about zero trust is that identity is not just who you are, right? But it's also the device you're using and context as Justin was explaining. Well, device is not authenticated. There is some sort of a knack, right? So yes, these are technologies that we know of. Uh, there's some sort of a NAC network access control and device is not authorized. So attacker doesn't get any further, but we know that that's not always the case, right? Uh, the malicious actor can have users device and credentials by phishing, for example, the attacker has now access to a device that is authenticated. What's gonna happen? Are you going to you know, block that right away? No, that's the reality, right? You're going to allow that because the user is authorized, the uh, device is authorized, but what are you doing? You're doing segmentation based on tiers, based on roles, based on classification, right? Uh, you can take this to the extreme to the point where it hurts. Micro segmentation can really hurt you. And we're gonna talk about some experiences we've had with that, right? Uh, but if you have proper segmentation in place at different layers, 
something we cover in, in 530, right? Segmentation of layer two, a layer three, four, segmentation in terms of identity, uh, layer seven segmentation. This could be blocked at that particular point. Or even if that is somehow allowed, imagine that the uh, attacker is still allowed to pivot to that system since we were watching the behavior of that user. Maybe the user is pulling more data than they usually do. Uh, maybe you can do something like that with network flows right, and do some detection over there. You're going to do analytics. You're going to do detection. And you're going to find out that there is some strange behavior that doesn't correspond to that user. And you're going to dynamically react, apply policies, quarantine, which sounds an awful, an awful lot like NAC once again, right, Justin? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, and when you're looking at this, I mean, really, Ismail, aren't we saying that from a zero trust practical implementation, what we're trying to do is layer in multiple sets of technology in a cohesive fashion. Integration, absolutely, absolutely. Where the objective is not just to, you know, block the attack and, and prevent attacks. No, it's to prevent damage, right? And where the damage, well, let me rephrase that, to prevent, uh, uh, um, you know, high damage or high impact by limiting, by limiting that. So it's all about the time. Right? So are, How are you fast saying that I can't just buy at? one product though? <laughs> well, let's talk about that, right? <laughs> Can you do all of this with one single product? First of all, is zero trust, like zero, like 100%, like fully attainable? And what are the tools that we can use for, for that? So that's what we're gonna be doing now. We, we talked a little bit about the model, but we didn't want to spend all the time on, on that. Hey, this is, you know, it's a sand summit at the end of the day, right? So we wanna showcase what we can do, what uh, our audience blue teamers can do based on the references that we have, uh, uh, that have been published in the last few days. Uh, for example, under zero trust, we say that all the traffic must be authenticated and encrypted, right? And this encryption end to end. So we're not, you know, doing VPNs. We're not, we're just encrypting end to end, which creates some sort of a, you know, a few problems. But let's talk about the authentication piece as well. Is there anything, Justin, that we can use that you have experience with? Uh, maybe a whole new product or a whole new technology that we can buy for this? For buying, I, I, I'm really a fan of identity management, IAMs or bro identity brokers. Uh, we also have some of the stuff that we've always had access to that is technically free, like Active Directory, TLS itself. We don't typically think of that as authentication, mm -hmm. but it can. IPsec, which is not new. And I definitely think the larger you are, we're going to be pushed more towards identity management systems and then integrating those with products like Next Gen Firewall and stuff. But we also want to talk through some concepts that you can apply like right now without buying stuff. Uh, although clearly as you go to adopt this model, there will need to be commercial products for this stuff, especially identity management. But let's start with like TLS here, right? You go to a website today, what you've got the little green bar, you've got the trusted cert and it says, yep, that's the site I meant to go to. You are in a way proving, yep, that's the server I meant to connect to. But does the server prove you're supposed to connect to it? And the answer to that is often no. And so what we can do, you just will go ahead and do the next slide for me, Ismail, yep. is with concepts like TLS at an email system, at a web server, at you know, even things like Slack and Teams, if you're under your control, like you can just turn on client verification, which actually does client certificate checks. Now. How hard is that to turn on? Assuming you have certificates deployed on IAS, you check that required client certificates button. For Apache and Nginx, you turn on SSL verify client and point out a CA. What is this giving me, right? Because it's just client authentication. Imagine for a second, you took something like a known vulnerable WordPress on a known vulnerable Apache instance, put it out on the internet. Now, if I want to attack that, I go find a payload, I point it at the WordPress site and I exploit it. But that assumes that I can actually connect to it first. Well, with normal TLS, you can connect to it. But with MTLS, mutual TLS, I have to have a client certificate or I have to find a flaw in TLS, which is few and far between. It can theoretically happen, but it's, it's unlikely, right? 
So at this point now, I can have something internet facing and you can't attack it even though it has multiple exploits because you can't connect to it. <laughs> because you're turning on client verification. It's an extra form of validating an identity, which in this case is typically a workstation or the user itself with certs. So it's something we all have access to. Yeah. It does require a PKI, which is a bit painful. So, but there's other concepts. Uh, Ismail, what about domain isolation? I like this one um, as well because it's something that it's been out there for a long time. And just like mutual TLS authentication, you know, it's it's simple. Well, maybe this one is not that simple, uh, but it creates some sort of a like a force field, right, around uh, your network. Uh, this is like. Um, uh, Avenger style, right? <laughs> any, any Marvel uh, Universe fans here? So this is like Avenger style. You see uh, there is like a city, right? It's surrounded by this force field so you can actually not see it. The attackers cannot see the, the city. This is the same idea. You have IPsec, like wrap, wrapping up your network. And yes, IPsec is not just a protocol that you can use for VPNs. In fact, it's not a protocol. It's a set of protocols uh, that you can use for remote access. But did you know that IPsec is also built into the Windows firewall? So you can implement this concept of domain isolation on a Windows domain. So the idea is that now systems can not only encrypt the uh, traffic between them when they communicate with each other, as long as they are in the same domain, but they also authenticate each other. So going back to just this example, if you have somebody, uh, a malicious actor on the network that is not authenticated, it's not part of their domain, Right now, they're not going to be able to see any of these any of these systems, so that mitigates that risk of man in the middle, and uh, it uh, lowers the uh, exploitation risk as well. Now, what that what does that look like if we had like a sensor on the network? Or, you know, we capture the packets and we open them up on on Wireshark. You can see without IPsec, we have a ICMP echo request, echo replies, just a ping. Right, with IPsec, what we see now is ESP protocol IP50, right? data encapsulated on the network. So we have encryption and we have authentication, which by the way, it's also what the government is mandating right now that uh, agencies implement as part of the zero trust step strategy, encrypting all the things, including, wait for it, including DNS queries. <laughs> now, as predicted by Eric Conrad, right? you probably saw uh, Eric's presentation. If you didn't, you should. Eric's presentation last year at the Blue Team Summit 2020, he was talking about how um, the industry is going towards that, DNS encrypted queries. And that is can be a problem for, for defenders because for many years we have been you know, preaching that you have to put the sensors on the network, uh, you know, like Zig sensors and to obtain visibility of these DNS queries. But now with uh, those cores being encrypted over HTTPS or over TLS, you can obtain that visibility on the network. So where do you have to go for that visibility? The endpoint, right? Uh, do, what do you think about that, uh, Justin? I think this is a very interesting statement. Uh, oh, yeah. There's two things in here that I'm saying. And one, we've got the thing of log and inspect everything, but then we're saying encrypt everything. And these two are very contradictory to each other. And so what I'm seeing, especially in the new paper, is do all of your monitoring at the endpoint. There's heavy push for EDR. There's use of TLS 1.3, and they say do not do SSL inspection. Basically is what they're saying. Don't inspect it. Don't open it, which means you're doing all of your monitoring at the endpoint. And while that is theoretically possible, things like DOH, that's still hard to do depending on the application calling it. And what if there's a rootkit on the endpoint? The endpoint's now lying to you. Well, historically, what did we do? We would correlate that with another data source, often at the network. So what I'm starting to see is this push towards trusting endpoints explicitly. And I don't know if I agree with that. Plus, which is easier to monitor? A few network sensors that can see lots of things versus tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of endpoints. One's hard to manage and one it's still hard, but it's a lot easier than the other. And so now what I'm going to start seeing is like DOH. You might want to roll your own DOH, DOT servers, DNS over HTTPS, DNS over TLS, if you're not familiar with what those are, so that you can basically proxy requests so you can see DNS requests again. 
we've been doing it with HTTP forever. We've been doing it with SMTP. Well, now we still need our DNS. Uh, I've caught so many uh, infections, breaches, et cetera, with DNS. You can't just magically take that away from me. I mean, you can try, but we're going to fight. <laughs> in, in fact, in fact, it's uh, one of the recommendations in another document that was just released this week that talks about what you need to lock, right? And passive DNS, it's, uh, it's a very important uh, type of lock for, for defenders. So, so as you can see, that's why I say, just in that, I don't think that zero trust is fully attainable. Definitely, you can do less implicit trust. But at some point, you take trust away from something and you put it onto something, something else. Right, so it's important to see the full the full picture. Otherwise, we might be just like, you know, uh, uh, creating new problems uh, in this way. Let's talk about identity, right? I, I think we mentioned before that identity it's very important. It's the foundation of the zero trust architecture. But what is identity in this in this model, uh, in, in this framework? Is it just like the user and the device? Because if we're saying that we're going to put applications out there on the internet, uh, that can be a problem as well, right? Yeah, and and I, and I want to stop because I know like. I'm already seeing a whole bunch of stuff on, on Slack that you're a little confused at what zero trust is. And I get it because that's why we're having this talk. <laughs> zero trust is continuous ongoing verification. It's assuming you shouldn't trust something. Therefore, I need to continuously verify it. That's why we're bolting on things like MTLS and IPsec or using identity brokers. And so the question here is if I'm trying to continuously verify I need context to validate against. With zero trust, you're gonna hear about this new term called a network agent. That is typically from all the vendors I see, user plus the device you're coming from. So I can go into a, here as an example, this is a FortiGate firewall. I can do this on a Palo Alto, a checkpoint and so on, right? And I can say, rather than just doing like layer four rules, which are really based on IP addresses and ports, I can actually tie those to workstations themselves or user accounts. There's the network agent. But I have a problem with this. Is it much better than what we had before? Yes. As an example, I've got a client right now that's in on-premise data centers, multiple of them. They're in AWS, multiple tenants. They're in Azure and doing rules based on IP addresses doesn't scale. But doing rules based on users and workstation network agent flows, wow, that, that's a lot, lot more smooth of a transition. But it's not enough. And so what I'm hearing is people are reading into zero trust, network agent, you know, identity, you know, that's the new perimeter. And I would agree with that, but it needs more context. To me, your identity is your user, the device, in any other context I can get, the time of day, maybe during certain times, certain users shouldn't access things. Your geolocation, your frequency of access, any of the continuous monitoring, behavior analytics, machine learning, you can factor all of that in as context. That's where we need to start getting to, but you need to do so in a way that integrates, thus making zero trust really hard to implement. This is more of a simplified answer of, user plus device and a firewall, that's one way of trying to approach this. And remember the variable trust, right? That means that you will have to change, you know, these rules um, automatically in an automated fashion to implement that concept, which, you know, it is possible because you have APIs, right? With these firewalls, we have software defined networking. So definitely it's possible. But as you can see, we are going to be dependent on solid detection and analytics capabilities, which is something we're going to be discussing in a, in a second, right? Um, but before we move into, into the detection piece, which to me is central to this discussion, um, how do you feel about Active Directory? Like we're saying, you know, zero trust, do not trust anything, but identity is the most important thing. You have to have single sign on across, you know, all systems and yeah, but we have Active Directory, right? And, and, and we have like the, the lunch stalling every single day, as we saw before with, with Active Directory, what, what can we do? I threw a couple of things in there. Um, I, I like one of the statements that I see in, this, in these documents. It says something like, you should see your applications as the attackers see them. This is something I, I say a lot. I think red, act blue, right? You're going to see if you come to 530, you're going to see that a lot. 
a way to do that would be to use the tools that attackers use, right? To see how, what's the fastest path towards domain admin, towards uh, uh, getting um, uh, access to your entire domain. Bloodhound is a tool that can do that. But, you know, in the last few uh, days, I was more familiar with, uh, Justin told me a little bit about Pink Castle. Have you used this uh, yourself, uh, Justin? Oh, yeah, I love Pink Castle. And I always have to be careful because you do have to have a license if you're doing it consulting, but it's not that expensive. For you doing it to your own organization, it's free. And it's fantastic. I almost consider it like a vulnerability scanner for Active Directory um, because it's going to let you know, like, um, literally, like, uh, this was three months ago, I was looking at an organization. We were running Bloodhound and Pink Castle. We ran them both, right? And they're like, oh, yeah, everything's secure. We don't, we only allow a few people in domain admins. And I was like, but you have an intern that's a domain admin. And they're like, what? No, <laughs> no, we don't. I was like, yeah, because your intern's in this group, which is a member of this group and this group and this group, which is then added to domain admins. Nested groups. Love and they're nested groups. And Pincastle will find things like, well, they're not technically in nested groups, but you've got a user in this domain who is then trusted to this force over to here. It will find things like Bloodhound paths, but how to fix them. Because what you're going to find is identity is extremely important with zero trust because it's what we're building our logic flows against. But that means it's even more important than ever that you actually evaluate it. Like Bloodhound maps out like path of least resistance to gaining access to something. We say domain admins, but really what happens if a doctor has access to all patient records? Who can yep. get access to being a member of the doctor's group then? Because I guarantee you it'll be things other than just doctors sometimes. King Castle will find flaws in Active Directory implementations that maybe it's just because you started as Windows NT and you've DC promoted and forced upgraded over the years, but that left remnants behind that you didn't know about that can be used against you. So we need to clean this up and we've got to have a strong, solid identity management and be careful with single sign-on, Active Directory single sign-on. That means once you're logged in, you often have an access token and it's not revalidated unless you force it to be. And so this goes back to where Ismail said, we need to start thinking at the application level. If someone has not been active in the application for so long, should someone be able to just immediately pick up the session? Depending on how critical the data is, you might want to re-authenticate them rather than just letting them refresh a token. Is it inconvenient? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but that could stop. Like maybe malware runs after hours because your token's still on the box. Windows is notorious for those tokens not being cleared until things like a reboot. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's all very interesting, Justin, but looks like you're talking a lot about protection, right? We're talking a lot about protection at the end of the day. And, you know, I, I spent some time uh, this week, like going through different uh, marketing material, vendors material about zero trust. And I have to say, most of this uh, uh, material is talking about protection, right? But is that what this is about? Well, we said that variable trust, and I, I can see some of the messages on Slack, people saying, we love this concept, right? Variable trust. I agree. It's fantastic. But that re relies on automated responses. And anybody that has worked in a SOC knows that you got to be careful with that, right? With automated responses, you can break things. So that depends a lot on having solid detection, correlation, and analytics. And for that, the first question sometimes is, you know, what type of logs do we need? And um, I, I know somebody that has a class on, on you know, logging and seeing um, what's his name? I think somebody born in 1986, right? <laughs> yep. yep. So, th this is one of the things that I love the most is logging inspection. I don't want to go too far down that because I'm not here to self-promote, but logging to me is a key aspect of when you get the right data, well, then you can start to do things like the variable trust concept. How do I know Ismail's being sketchy? I have data that helps me see it. He's going to websites we've never seen before, whether they're newly created or not. He's accessing social media. He's uploading certain types of file extensions. He's launching macros. These are all like, he's doing flow, multiple flow connections when historically he hasn't, whether it's behavior analytics, whatever. Those are all data that gives me context and informs me. 
which I then can use to better implement protection controls. How about this? What internal assets access other internal assets? You have hundreds of subnets. Well, if you have the right data, you could say, well, for the last year, this subnet is only ever connected to these subnets. Now I can put prevention controls in using that data. But it's interesting because a lot of the zero trust stuff you're going to see is basically preventative or control-based implementations. Now, we still say log and inspect all things. First of all, don't log everything. Please don't do that. Please don't. Stop. Log what matters. <laughs> That's a completely different discussion because I could, I could talk for hours just on that one topic. But I need good data to implement variable trust because when you go to put logic into different technologies, what's the decision? You can't really come to a good, safe decision without data. And I'm not talking just behavior analytics, machine learning, all of that. And yes, for me, it's the sim. It could be EDR, to be honest. EDR doesn't replace SIM, SIM does not replace EDR. So to me, it's somewhere you have a repository of data, multiple data sources, and you're interconnecting them together so that you can run reports, make that informed decision. And to me, that, that's a SIM. SIM today is still something we very much need. For some of you are like, well, what about XDR? Whap! Okay, sorry, moving on. <laughs> Because think about it like this. If I go up to Ismail and say, hey, Ismail, tell me about Google. Well, it's a website. You just went there. Okay, no, no, no. You know, it's google.com. It's hosted on these IP spaces. It's registered to this entity as an ASN. I did find it interesting. ASNs are now part of some of these discussions too. It's a top 1 million frequently accessed site. It has an NLP frequency score of 18.277. A solution should spit out all this information, which gives you more context for false positive reduction and tuning, for investigating from a threat hunting perspective, and <clears throat> more variable trust concepts. You want this type of technology. Something that, that I have found with these documents, Justin, as well, is that they, they, as they usually do, right? They tell you what you need to do, even with the uh, define what logging or what logs are, matter. Uh, what login you want to have. Uh, these documents give you like uh, now a list of, hey, start with this, right? You need to have this. You need to have the timestamps in this format. You need to have passive DNS. You need to have, and for how long you got to retain it. But it doesn't necessarily tell you how to do things. And just as an example, I extracted this paragraph from the document. That, to me, it just, it says so much in just a, a few words. Talking about automated responses, it says, for you to be able to do this with a mostly hands-off approach, automated, false positives and false negatives must be low. Wow. Yeah. So we've been doing this for 35 years, right? How good are we at having uh, low false positives and low false negatives? And that brings me a lot of questions. Actually, isn't that a contradiction? And something I, I usually like to explain is when you're looking for a real-time detection tool, uh, or a technology, you want this to be low false positives, right? I mean, you don't want to be flooded with false positives, and especially if you want to react automatically to implement variable trust, to quarantine, to isolate, to uh, block a user. But inevitably, if you want to have low false positives, what are you going to have? I mean, even if you want to use machine learning and AI and all of that, which a lot of these, it's still sprinkled with a lot of signatures and rules and because machine learning uh, models can throw a lot of false positives. What, do you, what are you going to have? Inevitably, you're going to have high false negatives. So that's why blue teams know that you need to be doing threat hunting to have low false negatives, right? You don't care about the false positives with that. You just want to find those things that your detection mechanisms haven't found because otherwise they will be too noisy. And that's going to be always a constant you know, battle between these two things. Detection and protection is not the same as threat hunting. And you need all of these different things. So I think one of the biggest challenges that uh, everybody's going to have to implement zero trust is to have that solid detection in order to implement uh, a variable uh, trust and to implement automated reactions. So in the past, we have been talking a lot about how to prioritize these detections in the same way we talked about prioritizing logs, right? What do you want to focus on? 
what's important for you? Well, threat modeling helps you to, to do that. And in the past presentations over the last couple of years, I talked a lot about how to do that with MITRE ATT&CK matrix. Today, I want to just touch briefly on, on a concept that it will be uh, based on what I have seen on the agenda, other speakers will talk more about how to implement things like this. But, you know, coming from Spain, you know, I'm a big soccer fan. We call it football over there because you play, play with the food, right? <laughs> but uh, uh, I like how this coach, Guardiola, right, big fan of, uh, of his work, how he uh, analyzes these games. And there is actually a network science behind all of these. And if you want to learn more, just check these references. But essentially what he says is that he, in order to come up with a solid defensive strategy, he analyzes the opponent, how they move, right? How they triangulate. And, and you can automate a lot of this and come up with a defensive model for this. Now, how do we blue teamers do this? I want to show you something cool. This is something I have uh, uh, done myself with uh, my team and my day job. It's a visualization uh, that I did with uh, GORS. GORS is a tool that is actually used to visualize uh, software version control, right? But you can do this with, uh, you know, Git data, or you can do this with EDR data. That's what I'm using here. In fact, you're looking at, I anonymized uh, quite a few things. It's a real activity coming from a victim of a dark side ransomware attack. And you can see how there are two users interacting with the system at a certain tempo. But now at some point in the next few seconds, there's going to be a third user, which is actually the attacker, that has stolen some credentials on the network that is going to interact with uh, the file system, the network, and uh, jump across boxes. See that one? Look at all the artifacts that are being created. This is a really great way of visualizing like how the attack is happening, what attackers are doing. What you see right there is the command and control, right? The beaconing, the source port incrementing by one, all that cool stuff. Now, it's exactly the same thing as looking at a log, but Sounds much cooler, right? To, to do it like, like this. Now, what's the, 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 the science behind this? It's the same as you know, ballistics. In fact, in our team uh, with my buddy Carlos Diaz, we call this cyballistics, which is studying these weapons, in this case, attackers' weapons, and finding out what's the behavior that they exhibit, what's the impact, right? If you were, for example, building a vest to protect against uh, you know, one of these uh, weapons, you would analyze the weapon, you know, the type of bullets, and what's the impact so you can design a safe vest right, to, to save lives. Well, same idea. You can analyze attackers' weapons. And yes, I know that we always talk about TTPs, right? And, and tools are behind that in the, in the pyramid of pain. But still, it's a good starting point. Because I'll tell you what, I see this on a regular basis. About 80, if not more, maybe 90% of the attacks that we see these days are using tools that are available out there like Cobalt Strike, like Bloodhound and, and others. So by analyzing how these uh, weapons behave, what are the, what's the impact they uh, create on the network, on you know, privileges, services, registry. For example, right here, we're looking at Ryuk, right? You can see that the most impact is on privileges, network, and services. Well, so for example, what privileges are being abused? SE debug. Now, what do you do as a defender? You want to apply active countermeasures and passive countermeasures. Passive countermeasures, monitoring, right? Needed for variable trust. Active countermeasures, these are going to give you time, right? You're going to block. You're going to get more time. So this is not something you can do with just one single product, as you can see here. It's a combination of things, including GPOs, for example. Very briefly in, in class, we talk about how you can do this with, uh, to defend against rogue router advertisements in IPv6. Very interestingly, if you go and look for how um, uh, attackers weapons like Metasploit implement this, you're gonna find specific behaviors and specific IOCs that you could analyze and you could turn into active countermeasures and, and passive countermeasures. Obviously, we're going to share all these slides with you. We know there's a lot of information here, but at least we want to challenge a little bit your, your mind, right? And, and the way we do, we do things. We're, we're going to share all these details with you. But at some point, you got to share all that information, right? But what, what projects are out there? I know you're a big fan of, of Sigma. Oh, yeah. this, this, is well. like, this is probably my favorite open source project out there. Florian Roth, Thomas Patsky, the Sigma generic signatures, 
It's basically the ability to write a rule in one language, the Sigma format, and then translate it to your specific product. Go ahead and go to the next one. I'll just do it here. So basically I write this YAML style rule that you're seeing on the left, which is in this case, looking for uh, CMD being launched from like Microsoft Word, Microsoft and Excel. Problem is historically it's been like, oh, it's a Splunk rule. It's a Windows Defender ATP rule. It's a PowerShell rule. It's a QRadar rule. And when you switch products, your rules can't switch with you. If I write a rule, I can't share it with you because you're using a different tool than I am. Next mm -hmm. slide for me, please, Ismail. And so now what happens is I write one rule in Sigma format and I convert it to any tool I want that's supported. And there's a ton of them. So like I tend to use like Elastic or OpenSearch personally. I have nothing against Splunk, QRed or the others. It's just what tool I use. And I hate that we get so hung up on tools, but now I'm like, oh, Ismail, he works for McAfee, that trader. <laughs> Here's a Sigma rule. He can use the rule. He has something and he translates it back into Spl uh, Sigma for me. And now I can use it. And now I'm not locked into a vendor and we can start sharing like the Sigma rule repository by default has about 600 rules. They're awesome. And so now we can start having shared rule sets. It's super powerful. You're not reinventing the wheel. And you're not starting from scratch. Go ahead. Big shout out to Florian Roth, who's uh, with us also today. Thanks so much for all your awesome contributions to the, to the community. And finally, you know, we said before that one of the big mistakes that we, we typically make is thinking that security is digital, right? Security is not zero or one. It's analog. It's just like time. And if you think about the, the philosophy behind zero trust, it's about extending the protection time, right? In the same way that a physical you know, door or a wall doesn't stop an adversary, it's just like giving you time. Think about your protection controls as that, something that gives you time while you invest in shortening your detection and reaction time. So when you start thinking about time, you know, some interesting questions may, may arise. And uh, for example, one of the first laps we do in 530 is uh, exfiltration, like emulating an exfiltration. Everybody does red teaming, right? Great, awesome. Uh, penetration testing, of course. But do you actually emulate you know, how uh, uh, much or how long it would take to, for attackers to do actions on objectives, right? Exfiltration, to obtain domain admin, to achieve privilege escalation. Uh, I'm a big fan of this show, Money Heist, right? And maybe some of you have watched it. And if you realize this show, it's all about not how to break in to you know, the bank, uh, to rob the money or the gold. It's about how to take it out when you're under siege. So think about uh, this from the perspective of the attacker. What can help you to win time, to extend protection time and reduce detection and reaction time? Uh, we're a big fan of these technologies that we don't like to call them deception, right? Because I think it loses context. Uh, it's more like tripwires, uh, creating diversion. Like for example, the labyrinth. Right, It's redirecting the attacker towards a different place where there is limited damage and they can, uh, uh, they can engage with this while we gain time and we can react to this. I know you're a big fan of this as well, uh, Justin, service banners. Oh, yeah. So this is, you know, you connect to a website and it says, hey, I'm Apache 2.4.18. So if you want to attack me, you have an exploit for that version of Apache. Here you go. Why? Why, why? why do we do that? You browse to a, a web page, you give it its user agent. User agents are slowly going to go away, by the way. Well, mm -hmm. we can change the rules. We don't have to play fair. So what we could do is go into Apache's config and we can use this token idea where we can change it to just say Apache. If you're going through a reverse proxy, well, I'm IIS. <laughs> why? Because if you're going to run an exploit against IS, but I'm really Apache, it should work. I mean, I hope it would work. And when you test this, like if you ever deploy like a, a live systems out on the internet for research, this totally works. I've got the SEC 530 shows up as a Windows 10, IIS 10 box. And there's exploits constantly ran against it for IIS. They clearly don't work. But behind the scenes, it's really a, oh, wait, this is recorded. I can't tell you. 
<laughs> you could probably still find out with some more advanced fingerprinting techniques, but that's the, that's the thing. We don't have to always play by transparent rules for the attackers. You do have to be careful you don't break things, but a little bit of testing and you'll know it works, it doesn't work. So modify your service banners potentially. So we made it to the end of the, uh, the, the presentation. Again, our objective, uh, our goal was to you know, challenge your mindset, just you know, showing you a few of the principles with, five, uh, with um, zero trust, but also like showing you more importantly, what's behind those principles, right? And what are the things you can, you can do? Uh, DISA gives you this maturity uh, journey. That's what zero trust is, right? It's a journey, it's a philosophy, it's a strategy. So I encourage you to check it out. Um, it all starts with realizing what's your high value assets, right? What are you trying to protect? What's the problem you're trying to, to fix? And uh, uh, that's, that's what this is, this is about. It's a strategy, right? As we have in the, the meme there. Uh, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna have to figure it out over the weekend, right? Uh, but it's all about integration and it's mostly about using, you know, reusing what we have. It's not always about, you know, going and buying new things. Obviously new technology can help, uh, but, but that's the mindset that we want to communicate with, with this. So implement zero trust and your security risk will be reduced by 100%. <laughs> and your sales will go up by 100% too. You can't hold me to any of this. I did notice there's tons and tons of questions. Normally when we do presentations, we pick a topic and we drill down very deep. We didn't do that for this. And that's because zero trust isn't that. Zero trust is many things broadly focused, and then there's drill downs from each of those. So the good news is, and John, don't worry, I'm putting on my summit chair hat rather than my presenter hat for a second. The good news is there are so many talks that actually extend what Ismail and I are talking about and cover it more deep, like Mark's getting ready to come up here with Grace and go through more modern authentication and identity management, how to lock some of that down. We've got talks about blue team, like code is infrastructure, right? We've got all this stuff coming up that will start to drill down through this much more. So I'm excited. Even like the threat sightings with AC3 and we got a good lineup. So John, over to you.